My name is Lauren Bailey. My friends call me LB. I'm happy you're here with me. We're going to have a good time. This is a new topic for us to present live at Factory. We've been teaching closing as part of selling for, gosh, 13 years this year. But I'm usually not out talking about it. I'm usually talking about top of funnel or talking about confidence and, and those kinds of things. So it's the first time I've presented on this subject and I'm really excited about it. We are recording. If anybody has to drop off at the halfway point, I will not take it personally, but I will write down your name and email you. No, I'm kidding, I won't. We'll make sure everybody gets the recording afterwards. If you have to drop halfway, um, make sure you watch it. We're also doing an offer at the end, like everybody does in a webinar, but I am stealing tips and tricks out of um, three or four key classes that I'm gonna be referring to in here. And those are all available virtually now. So we're gonna give everybody an offer to not only take the classes online, including live calls and cool stuff, but also um, live sessions. So it's e-learning, it's videos, it's worksheets. And yes, we even have recorded calls, real calls where you can hear these skills being applied. That's what's fun about our platform. We call it the sales bar. That's the other thing that's fun, serving up training. Please learn responsibly. We think we're really punny. We do it. Well, the bar puns are coming out of our ears. If you're just joining, my name is Lauren Bailey. You can call me LB. We're going to get started in about 30 seconds. I have a couple people who are dialed in just on the phone. Um, and so I'm going to do my best along the way to read out the slide, not just let the slide speak for itself. If you can join and look at the visuals as well, that's going to help. Cool. Um, by the way, my goal is to make this a little bit interactive. I want you to play along. So I will be asking you to chat every once in a while with some answers along the way. Cool. Um, I know everybody's just wrapping up meetings and our numbers are starting to jump up through the roof. So I will give everybody 30 more seconds. In the meantime, here's your first chat quiz. One really cool thing you did as the year passed whether it was in the first two weeks of the year, whether it was drunk on New Year's Eve, what, who's can chat something in that was something cool about the new year passing besides just 2020 being over. Your first chat quiz, fireworks. We always put off fireworks, right? But I love how you're like, um, yeah, that was to celebrate that it's over. Thank you for that. Nobody else has something cool they did? I um, played a board game with my kids and my mother-in-law and a friend. Um, it was Telestrations, which is like Pictionary plus the old telephone game combined. I laughed so hard I peed a little. True story. Oh, skiing. Nice. Oh, you know, Carolyn, I have a dog who's scared also of the fireworks, but good for us. He's kind of got deaf in the last year, so I didn't have to worry about it. Tube sledding. That's fun. Trekking. Cool. This is great. Climbed a mountain. You guys are awesome. Yeah. Work free a few days. Skiing. Oh, that's great. Good for you guys. That's so good. I drank wine and played a board game. That's pretty not exciting. There we go. All right, shall we kick this puppy off? Uh, it is top of the hour and we're gonna spend the next 55 minutes talking together about closing. As I said before, Factor 8 is typically known for helping people kind of top of funnel. And this time we're gonna flip it around and we're gonna focus on the bottom of the funnel. So here's what we're gonna cover together today. Um, if you don't know me already and missed the previous slide, I'm Lauren Bailey, founder of Factor 8, the Sales Bar and Girls Club, my friend LB. And today we're going to talk about some shocking closing stats, why we don't close, big focus on shifting the mindset. I'm going to give you some techniques we approve of, um, and that's important because we hate hard sellers. When to close, how to close every call, so ABC might not be dead. And we'll talk a little bit about what this means now that you're virtual for my field friends who are on the inside now. All right, here's our second chat quiz. I need a number. According to the sales board, what percentage of sellers don't close? I've got chats on this screen over here. So here we go. 
70, 80, 60, 60, 753. <laughs> David, loving you, that's a typo. 75, 68, 60, 70, 35. So I have a range right now for a 35 to 273, just teasing you. Survey says 64%. You guys were right on the money. Yeah. So most of us, in fact, more than one out of two of us on this call don't routinely close. Very interesting. Now, here's the reason this is extra bad. I loved this study. Um, Impact Business Partners put it together and they basically just did a huge old kind of anecdotal research. It wasn't millions of people. It was a smaller set, but it went deep. And they did lots and lots of scenarios. And in throughout all of these scenarios, they tracked if somebody doesn't ask for the close, what percent closed themselves? So would you guys guess that one for me, please? We're going to type this in. What percent of buyers or prospective buyers will close themselves? Much lower numbers. Right now, two is my bottom. 40 is my high. 75 from Mike. I like, I like your industry, Mike. That'd be great. Two to 75. That's our range. Seeing a lot in the 20s. There's a 15 from Steve. Check this out. Their research said actually only 10% will close themselves. Interesting, isn't it? Sometimes we think we've done all we can. Um, I will tell you a story for just a moment. Um, on the other half of my business that you see behind me is Girls Club. And Girls Club, our mission is to help more women earn sales leadership positions. And um, I have an opportunity to speak about that all over the world, um, all the time. And here's what happens. I get about 10,000 people hitting the site, asking for information, super, super duper, duper passionate. At the bottom of the funnel, for every one of those, I get about one applicant. My close rate for girls club of people who are interested to actually signing up and applying is 0.5%. I notice, however, that when I have the time to talk to someone individually, my close rate is about 70%. That doesn't work because I don't have time to talk to 10,000 people and I don't have sales reps assigned to Girls Club, right? If this, nobody's making any money, we're, we're barely in the black. Um, it, it, but that's the difference right there between marketing, which is everything you see about what we do with Girls Club on social media, on email, on webinars, and sales when one person talks to one person. That is why we all have jobs, okay? There are rumors and shocking statistics every year about selling being a thing of the past. We don't need salespeople, we have the internet. Marketing has gotten way the heck into our space. Bots and chat are never going to replace what we do because only 10% of customers will close themselves. They need the personal touch to close. All right, so hopefully we shifted a few mindsets already. Here we go, we're gonna play Family Feud. Why don't sellers close? Top five answers are on the board. We surveyed actually probably nobody and made up these answers. I'd like you please to chat it in. What do you think is one of the top five reasons that sellers don't close? No budget, no follow-up. I'm disorganized. Ah, oh, I didn't even know. I should have checked back with you. They just don't ask for it. They just don't ask for it. They're giving up too soon. They don't put in the effort. The competition gets to them first. They send an email instead of calling. John King, loving your answer. Nobody ever sold anything over email. Not enough follow-up, not enough follow-up. It's not a qualified opportunity in the first place. They're waiting around. They've got too many calls to make. They're not solving their buyer's problems. Oh, look at all of these. We're going to see quite a few on the board. Shall we see what our unofficial survey says? Number five, they don't know when to close. This is where if we were in the family feud, you'd say, ah, oh, good answer. Good answer. Number four, sellers are out of the, thanks, Leela. They're out of the closing habit. 
okay? Like we talked about, they're just not doing it. Why are they just not doing it? Well, they don't know when to do it. And, and maybe some disorganization comes into that. They're out of the habit of doing it. That really lends to some of this effort that we've talked about over here. Number three, they're not closing because they don't have enough information to close. That goes into some of what we said, Carolyn, they're not solving the problems, right? They don't have what they need to get it closed. Number two answer on the board, they don't know how. I'm simply not even gonna go there because I don't know how. Number one answer on the board, I'm afraid. I lack the confidence. I might feel like I'm being too pushy. Nobody likes a pushy salesperson. I don't want to do it. I avoid it, which is why I get busy with too many calls or I have too many other things to do than to follow up and ask for the deal. So we're gonna do these one at a time. We're gonna start with number one answer on the board. I'd like to assert that closing actually helps the buyer. So what we're looking at here is the buying funnel. I'll give you a moment to look at that. For my phone and callers, it starts with problem recognition, info search, evaluate alternatives. Then I get into my purchase decision and post-purchase evaluation. We've all seen this before, right? Folks, when we help someone close, we shift them out of information search and into evaluation of alternatives. We help usher them down the buying path. That is a helping profession. Seems weird, right? But when we don't close, we help the buyer stay in research mode. And that's when they go dark, folks. Ever had a really great first call and then poof, right? They totally start ghosting you. Gaining clear next steps, close it. Call one helps the buyer move from information search into evaluation. And let's be honest, buying's fun. Aren't we happy when we get what we want? I gotta tell you, shopping, I hate. Shopping largely sucks. Buying, exciting. <laughs> Right? With Amazon, the close is simply every single time it's right there. Add to cart. That was the close. Add to cart. Ready to buy? Buy now. None of it said, sit here and think about it. Right? It wasn't until years later that Amazon added a save for later. And you don't even get that until you've gone to the cart. They just want to make sure that they're capturing what you didn't. Like if you're going to have remorse and back out, well, let me get one last chance to sell it to you. People are talking to you because they want to buy something. Help them buy it. Here's another way to look at it. Have you ever gone up to the counter at Starbucks and just started ordering? Or do you wait to be asked? Do you get in line at fast food while they're still putting money in the drawer and you know doing something behind them and say, okay, I'm gonna have a number one. Hey, anybody over there? Make that a large Diet Coke. We wait to be asked, right? It is our cue that it's time. Think about a recent time you bought something big or exciting, or maybe it was in a gift or a, a splurge for yourself, right? You've been thinking about it for a while and then you just did it. You were asking questions a minute ago and now you're doing it. I mean, you're really doing it. I'm, I'm having the experience right now. I put an offer in on a house one day ago. <laughs> I've been dreaming about this opportunity in this moment for two or three years now. And the excitement and panic that I feel right now is palpable, right? At, at some point, somebody finally asked me, okay, are we ready to actually do this? Thank God, because it got me to this stage. I have one other example I have to share with you. I have been putting off writing a book for about six years. I feel like I have it in me. I can't wait. I want to do it. It's something that's on my list. It's not just a have to, it's a want to, it's just, I can't get to, okay? So it, it just always gets pushed behind. And about two months ago, a rep from a publishing company called me with an offer, right? To help me write and publish the book. And of course it was a sales pitch, but wow, that's like, that's exactly what I've been thinking about. I've never said it out loud. I wasn't even in the funnel in terms of like evaluating alternatives. I was just, I'd recognized this opportunity. 
and I hadn't gotten any further. Well, I was excited about the conversation. The call went very well. I was pretty darn interested. I did a little bit of research afterwards. She never called me again. Never called me again. Now, I'm not actually blaming her for the fact I haven't written a book, but I would have loved it if she stalked me a little bit. I would have loved it if she'd helped me move out of this problem recognition and information search down into evaluation of alternatives and purchase decision. Folks, that's sales. It's not pushy, not doing it, not closing, lacks confidence, right? I don't think I would sign up with her now, right? Come on, don't you care enough? Don't you believe enough in what you do that you couldn't even call me back? Now I judge salespeople rather harshly because that's my profession right? And it's a lot of fun selling to salespeople. That's what I do. But eh, just remember, we're not pushing things on people who don't want them, my friends. They're looking for a reason. They've recognized a problem. Help them solve it and move on. All right, that's enough about the mindset stuff. Let's talk about the next nun on the board. They don't know how to ask. You got to have a go-to close. Most of the go-to closes we hear about are the really crappy go-to closes, right? The, let me roll the pen down. The, you've got to buy now, time pressure. You know, the cheesy closing tactics. We have jokes and movies about cheesy closing, ta cheesy closing tactics because we need closing tactics. It's not necessarily natural for us to go up to strangers and ask them to give us money, right? They're called tactics for a reason. You need to come up with your go-to that feels good for you and you stay with it. You use it all the time. You practice it in the mirror. You say it when you're alone in your car. You build muscle memory around your clothes. There is a moment of fear before you deliver it. Now, there's a couple of you on this call saying, what the hell is she talking about? I've never been afraid to close in my entire life and I applaud you. Nice job. I'm here to tell you that the other 90% has, have had some hesitation at some point. Otherwise, more than 60% of people would close more often. All right, so I'm gonna give you a couple go-to closes that we really like at Factor 8. If you don't have one already, steal one of these and then use it until it breaks, okay? Here's my favorites, the question close, the assumptive close, the witch pitch, the timeline, and the add-on. I have picked these out of about 50 different published closing techniques. There's something in my eye. I'm sorry, I can't stop fiddling with it. Um, because these, I believe, are the most customer centric. These um, work because we all have a number, but they don't insult in terms of how strong they are. Let's look at some examples. The question close. All right, how'd we do? Did we solve the problem? Does this meet the need? All right, I, this seems like a good fit. What do you think? Are you ready to move forward? There are some soft ones here and some more aggressive ones here. But a question in general is considered on the bottom half of your strength, your aggressiveness in a A question I use is how do we do? What do you think? Perfectly natural. You want the feedback. Okay, that's how you lead into the close with a question. Write one of these down if you like it. The next type of close is the assumptive close. Okay, well, we'll get this nailed down and we can get started on this next week. So that's super assumptive, right? How about we combine assumption with a question? So what's next? What happens next in the procurement crop process? Where do we go from here? What happens next on your end? What should our next steps be? Here's a pretty assumptive one. So when did you want to take delivery? When did you want to get this scheduled? When did you want to start onboarding? I uh, have a friend who schedules the kickoff call to get the clothes done. All right, this is great. So um, it looks like we could get our kickoff scheduled in about a week and a half. Does that work for you? Boom, that's assumptive closing. It absolutely does work. It's a little higher pressure. It gives the buyer a chance to be, it, there's a moment, right? Of, oh, okay, yeah, well, I guess we're doing this. This is how it's gonna work. All right, yeah, I'm in. 
that little bit of pressure is selling, right? You can not talk to them at all, or you can come in and be like, all right, are we doing this? When are we doing it? Let's get this moving. And that's what the buyer needs to push them down the funnel so they can feel great about it on the other end. The next one's the witch pitch. I use the witch pitch. I use the witch pitch all the way into my proposals, right? There are basically three different ways you can work with my company, the good, the better, and the best. I think we call them something cooler than that, right? And this is the low end and this is the high end and 90% of the people pick the middle. That's why we have a witch pitch. So you're talking to them about your solution and instead of saying, do you like the solution? Do you like me? Are you going to buy from me? Are you ready? You say, okay, well, which one's a better fit for you right now? Do you like option A or do you like option B? Which option's a better match for your need? Which option's a better match for your budget? Which option's going to work best in your company, for your people, for your boss? The witch pitch. I've got two more. The timeline. Timeline can help create and exert some pressure. You're basically trying to meet their need and showing them that they need to close now to meet their own need. This won't work if you're not asking them about timeline during the process. Hey, you said you wanted this training in place by the end of next month, right? Oh, working backwards, we're going to have to ink this by next week at the absolute latest. Another example. Okay, if we get started today, we can actually meet your deadline of going live by the end of next week. So grab their timeline and help them understand they need to close now to make it happen. All right, last one. And I'm going to ask you guys if you use any of these and if so, what it is. And then after that, I'll ask you if you use something that wasn't on my board. So the add on is basically buy now and get another one for free. If we sign by Friday, I can guarantee we can throw in that live training. If this is something you can commit to today, I can add five extra licenses to cover those new hires we were talking about next month. Sometimes people just need a reason, just one more little push to say, okay, now's a good time. For me, it was the fact that interest rates were so low and money was on sale, right? I've been thinking about this house for years and years and years. I've grown up, I bought my house before I was married and had kids. And now I've worked at home and homeschooled for six straight months. I need space. Why now? Great interest rates. I need a little push, something to get me off my butt. And that can be the add on. So let me ask you, which of these do you use? I'm going to go backwards. Add on. Give me a chat if you use one of these. Timeline. Which pitch? assumption and question. I'm getting questions and assumption, timeline, question. Today, Steve used timeline, good job. Question, assumption, question, assumption, almost always question. Uh, Christine, good job, you use a different one depending. Yeah, so does Millie. Question, assumption, question, assumption, timeline. Nobody else is a witch pitcher. That's interesting. Two options there, Lori, thanks. I hate being alone. A lot of questions. Good, it's really good. Who, um, who is brave enough to type in for me your, your go-to question? Let's, we can all steal from each other a little bit. What's your go-to question? Megan's another one who does all of them. Ariel's ready to start the witch pitch. How do we compare to your current supplier? What a good question. Nice job, Margaret. You're asking for feedback. It's perfectly valid. Is there anything we missed as we put this together? Lori, I love that you're saying what's your why and your pain points. We're just gonna do it before the close, right? Before the deal close. Oh my God, I'm just gonna keep my left eye closed for the rest of this, you guys. I will not ask you for your business unless and until I can give you a plan to improve it. So you're it, putting yourself out there as a trusted advisor. You're using that line early on. I like that. What did you hear today? What should our next steps be? What do I need to do to demonstrate partner? 
What do you think? Plain and simple. Carolyn, I like this again. What haven't we solved for? Is there any pain point we haven't answered? Tamara, I've never heard that and I love it. Everybody read hers. Imagine yourself a year from now. What have we helped you solve? What have you liked about the platform? Good. I like most of these are a series of questions, aren't they? You don't just do it all and then say like, so what do you think? Mic drop, walk away, they sign. It's a conversation and that's why I like it too. Nice job, everybody. Thank you for playing around. Oh, there's one more here I wanna see. Christine, we joke that selecting a partner is like a marriage. So we ask them if they're ready to put a ring on. I am gonna tell the story in a couple of minutes, Christine, but we are gonna laugh about Sunday over drinks. All right, here we go. Next section, survey says, I need more information. And Christine, here's that story. I, um, I was brought into a sales call with a large potential deal after I had done a kind of an SKO-ish sort of thing. It was like this, but just for their company and it was customized just for them and um, different topics. And then we were doing a follow-up, right? Did they want to use our services uh, for their reps and managers uh, throughout the company. And we were on like call three and it was a weird, you know, some of them are just weird, you guys. That's all there is to it. This one just felt weird the whole time. I felt like it was taking six or seven or eight calls to do what we would normally do in two or three. Do you ever have those? Where it's like, okay, well, let's talk about it again. Okay, let's talk about it again. And then when we get together, let's talk about what we talked about and then we'll talk about it again. Anyway, it was like call 27, I exaggerate. And I just like, I, I didn't know where to go. And, and I didn't know where to go because my sales process was completely out the window, right? And I wasn't driving the whole thing. My CRO was amazing, but I was just lost. And I finally just looked, I was like, so are, are you like, I'm, I'm not sure what you're telling me. Are you breaking up with me or are we gonna go steady? <laughs> So you do it on purpose and that makes it fun and funny. Mine was just embarrassing. It was like, I couldn't get a read whether he was breaking up with me. I mean, it literally felt like I was in middle school again. Like, are you going to kiss me behind the coat closet or are we not going to talk to each other at recess anymore? Because I'm not sure what's happening in this relationship. The guy got all red. I was so uncomfortable because I didn't know. I didn't know where I was. I didn't know where I stood. I didn't have all the information, but I didn't get that until I analyzed it afterwards, okay? Before you're ready to move to closing the deal, you absolutely positively have got to find the pain or the goal. If you guys can't agree <coughs> on what they're trying to solve, fix or get, fix or get, no point in proposing the solution and closing it. The why is the value to them. Business people have about six core values. Every feature or function will always tie back to one of them as the benefit. Time, money, making things easier, helping me look good, keeping me free from risk or giving me some sort of power or control over something, right? If you aren't getting to true values, then try to tie it to one of those. Of course, you gotta understand the budget and timeline. If you're trying to close something they don't need for three years, you're screwed. There's a reason, right? That, <laughs> that BAMP starts with a B and ends with a T. And you do have to understand the buying process. You can't use the timeline approach unless you understand what those steps are. So just this slide alone is gonna be about 10 questions. Even better, I can't tell you how often just understanding the basic gap is missing, current state, desired state before people are starting to close, right? That's what they mean by need in BANT, B-A-N-T. The competition absolutely tells us so much. So many of the closes over here I saw too were about, are we doing it better? How are we doing against the competition? So we gotta know that, right? Sometimes I, I feel like we forget the personal motivation. I know that I do. I look for the business value, one of those things I just told you, those six, but I don't always understand what it means for them personally. I don't slow down and take the time for that. And it would help me do better closes at the right time and get more closed more often. You guys, sometimes I feel like we're a little bit over-processed. 
um, the BANT, the ANIM, the whatever it is you're using, it's, a, it's, it's not just a checklist in a deal stage, right? The idea is that you actually have a deep understanding of these things. I know they need X, Y, and Z by A, B, C because of one, two, three. And if you can't fill that in, you've got no business closing. Now, for some of you, this is a great big duh factor, right? Of course not. You're seasoned sellers, you're professionals. I have taught a lot, a lot of early to mid-career sellers, and this is the number one mistake they make. It's the premature pitch, especially, by the way, in a BDR, SDR role. Now, you might say, what do you mean they don't close? But I'm going to tell you, hell yeah, they do. BDRs, SDRs close for the meeting, close for the demo, whatever is that next step in the sales process. And if they can get somebody who will actually stay on the phone with them for longer than 30 seconds, that's about when they pitch the meeting. And it's ridiculous. So premature pitch, it's not that they have trouble closing, it's that they shouldn't be closing and they will lose because they don't have all the information. I think I've beat this one to death. Here's a final stat to help bring my point home. According to CSO Insights, a huge percentage of deals are lost because we're not fully aligned to the buyer's needs. Want to guess the number for me? I'm getting an all man. Thanks, Melissa. What percent of deals are closed because we're not fully aligned before we go to close? Big numbers. 753. Again, David, is three your percentage? <laughs> 50. I've got 50 up to 753. Can I get a 65? Christine Wigger with a 65. Tammy Land comes in with 50%. Jason Pye for 65%. David Shoup, I see your smiley face and I raise you too. Sissy Kerrigan, 60%, 70% from Margaret. Actually, it's lower. I love that you guys think that it's so high because I agree. The truth is there's so many freaking reasons we don't close deals that this statistic, 26% is actually high. It's like the majority number. It's the number one reason we're not closing deals as we're not perfectly aligned, right? So the point here is if you're the one doing all the talking, don't even bother trying to close. Selling is not billboarding, right? If you're not getting interest and trying to get to a demo, <laughs> it's useless. You're doing it wrong. You're really, if you're just closing fast, you're only catching the fruit that's ready to fall from the tree or for maybe the fruit that's already on the ground. You're just walking around with a basket, picking stuff up, ask some questions, find some real needs and gaps, and then go from there. You'll find the closing so much easier. All right, let's get to our next reason on the board. Survey says they're just out of the habit. Closing is a muscle that we have to exercise often, or it is one that we avoid. We've proven that earlier. So I've got this theory on closing and the theory is that you can absolutely close every single call without being an asshole. And here's how you do it. It's called closing for commitment. So historically closing is actually a real estate term, right? Like closing on a house. Um, it later became known as the final step in the sales process. And I invite you to update your dictionary with a new definition that when you get a commitment, you get a close, okay? And if closing for a commitment, if a commitment equals a close, you absolutely can and should close every single call. So very few of us are in the one call close business anymore, right? We have to think of this as a step-by-step -step process, like dating, right? Folks, there are bases for a reason. You would not propose on the first date, right? You wouldn't go out to dinner and then meet the parents. There are steps to this in relationships and in sales. In fact, I think a better example is actually football. When you look at football in Europe, right, which we call soccer, the whole field is in play all the time, right? And they're all over the damn field. If you look at American football, we go 10 yards, and if we make it, we get our first down. And we move the chains, and we start from that yard line. Sales needs to be the same way, okay? When you get a commitment, what you're doing is moving the chains and locking in the sale from that step. Here's what I mean. At the end of a very first call, even if it was a cold call, if you can get the customer to say yes to something or take an action item, no matter how small, what you've gained is mind share. When you have mind share, 
you're not starting over in your own end zone the next time you talk to that customer. Does that make sense to you? I'm gonna ask you a why question. Think about it for a second and chat me in the answer. How and why does mind share with a customer lock in your field position? David, if you type 753 again, we're gonna have words, my friend. Kurt, you were close. Trust, show me you know me. Familiarity, transparency, trust, empathy, customer-centric. Hey, Lisa, the WIFM, from the customer point of view, we call SWIFT here at Factor 8. So what's in it for them? You're on the same page. Empathy, you understand the problem. Yeah, you guys, even if you don't get that far, even if you don't get to the point where after one call, I'm a trusted partner that's shown you empathy, when the customer's thinking about you because they have an action item to do, they said they would commit to something and they didn't for anybody else. Let's say they committed to taking a next meeting with you. You send a meeting invite, even if they no show, it's showing up on their calendar. Let's say they said they would send you something. They get to the end of the day and they didn't. Guess what? At some point, they still remember they were supposed to and feel a little guilty about it. Folks, guilt is a beautiful tool. <laughs> it's worked in the church for millions of years. It can work in sales too. Guilt works. It's okay. They remember who you are. Oh yeah, that's the person I was supposed to send that to. I feel kind of bad about that. That helps you. Okay. You got some mind share. They say they were going to do something. Here's, I love using this example. You RSVP to a party or you don't, right? Your buddy's having a party and like you say, oh yeah, that sounds cool. That's great. You get to Saturday night and you're watching Netflix in your underwear and you're thinking, man, I do not. I do not want to go. Now, this is obviously pre-COVID because right now we would all be like, oh my God, a party? This is fabulous. How can I get there? But you're laying on the couch in your underwear, eating popcorn, watching Netflix, thinking, I do not want to get up and shower and go to this party. Oof, but I said I would. I might still lay on my couch, if I'm honest. I might still lay on my couch, but I feel kind of bad about it. And the next time I talk to the person who had the party, I would totally be like, oh, wow, I'm really sorry, man. I feel bad about that. I'm going to think about you three or four times before I talk to you the next time. Now, let's say that I RSVP, yes, right? And I like put it out on Insta or Facebook or, you know, whatever on the interweb and everybody knew I was coming and then I still didn't show. Ooh, I'm going to feel even worse. That's going to be bad. You know what the worst one is? If it was my job to bring the beer. If it was my job to bring the beer and I still didn't show, that would make me feel bad enough to get me up off the couch. I not only said, yes, I'm coming, but I took an action item. My mind share, much higher. You can use that in step-by-step -step sales process. So let's take a look at what I mean by that. I'm gonna ask you on each one of them to type in yes or no. Did you get a commitment, AKA, is it closed? When the customer says, yeah, sure. You know what, feel free to give me a call back next week. Talk with my office manager, Joe. Is it closed? Booyah, nope. But you hear this all the freaking time, don't you? Okay, we are all masters of getting out of a conversation and owning nothing. Don't let it happen to you. All right, next one. Okay, I'll see if I can find out our current contract and see when it cancels. I'm getting a lot of no's on this one, but I might still be getting it from number one. Chances, yes. Customer says, I'll find our current contract and see when it cancels. Customer took an action item. Lynn is saying, yes, assuming a timeline. Yep, yep, yep. Make it better by saying, and I'll call you back. Uh-huh, even better, love it. Or they're blowing you off, could be. But you got a commitment. Can it be stronger? Heck yeah, nice job. All right, you guys are fast. Customer says, okay, I'll tell you what, give me a call next week. We'll take a look at my current service contract together. I'm committing to looking at this with you. But you have the action item, not me. It's a toughie, right? It's a yes. I'm with you, Megan. Just book the meeting. 
Uh-huh. I don't like it with a, yeah, give me a call next week. Because you and I both know it's going to take me 10 freaking dials to get you on the phone, man. And I got better things to do. Lock it in. But he did agree to look at the current service contract together. So that's a commitment. Customer says, yeah, go ahead. Send me the quote. I'll take a look at it. Maybe. No. Maybe. No. Action item. Ariel's right. I'm going to look at it. Maybe. Yeah, this is one of those where, yeah, they've made a commitment to look at it. But wouldn't it be great if we could get them to take further action? The rep owns most of this in sending it. That's why you never, ever, 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 ever send follow-up information. Yeah, send me more information on that. You're going to be busy for 20 minutes putting that stuff together, and it's never going to get opened because they have zero action items. All right, let's look at it from the rep point of view. When the rep says, um, okay, well, okay, good talking to you. Listen, if you do ever consider changing your vendor or if you have any service issues, give me a call. Hear this all the time. Is the rep closing for a commitment? That is a resounding hell no. Nice job, everybody. You got it. Number two, uh, rep says, all right, tell you what, if I send you my contact information, would you please hang on to it? Call me if your local vendor has any trouble meeting your needs. Did the rep close for a commitment? Getting a lot of no's. Getting a lot of no's. So here's how you, it's not bad, but it's not good, right? Here's how you know. Did the customer say yes? Hey, if I send you my contact information, would you hang on to it? Sure. So technically the rep closed, but it's a baby. It's a wussy close. Sometimes that's the best we can get though, isn't it? No, I'm good. I've got a vendor. I'm happy. I'm not shopping. I'm not interested. It's my brother. I'll never do business with you. I'll tell you what, here's the deal. I'm going to send you a contact card. If there's ever something he can't deliver for you by the next day, if something happens, if your brother's right, if you're pissed at your brother, if he doesn't have it in stock, would you please remember me? Just search your contacts for blah, blah, blah. And I'll be there hoping to earn more of your business. That was the play this person was making, right? All right, not bad, not bad. We still tried. You see, there are different levels of a commitment. Again, just like football, right? It's first and long, and I have an option of what I'm gonna do. Am I gonna do a running play? Am I gonna do a passing play? Am I gonna go for one or two yards? Or am I going for the Hail Mary? So here's an example, right? The first call commitment might very well be that the customer agrees to a next call. They're going to agree to come to the explore call. They're going to accept the meeting invite. They say they're going to show up. They may or may not, but you closed for it. After that one, the customer might be agreeing to consider a proposal. Third down, customer agrees to a trial. Touchdown, customer signs the annual contract. Okay, this is how it might work in the baby steps. But here's how it might work on short plays and long plays. Okay, this is again after call one. The customer's done the explore call. Now what? Well, if it went great, I'm probably going to go for a long bomb. If it was so so and I'm not feeling terribly confident, I might go for a short play. The short play would be like, all right, well, I'll tell you what. Could we set up a time Tuesday morning to review my proposal solution? Let's go for the next step. The longer bomb might be like, all right, well, here's our next step. We're going to review the proposal together and we're going to review the pricing with the buying team. Can we get everybody together on Tuesday? I asked for a little more, didn't I? I was a little more assemptive, didn't I? Okay, so closing for a commitment is an art. The science is do it on every call. Get in the habit of getting your customer to say yes. The art is knowing if you're going for a short play or a long play. There's a lot more that goes into this, but I'll tell you what, when you get good at it, it really speeds up your sales cycles. Next answer on the board, we're going to tackle, survey says, I don't know when to close. Okay, so here's a look at a simple sample sales process. 
That's like Sally sells seashells by the seashore. Question for the group. What stage is most critical to close? You know it's a trick question because I'm asking you for it. This is according to a gong study that came out a couple years ago. Type it in for me. Qualification? Is it call one in qualification? Is it the proposal? Is it the end deal, the close? Disco, disco, qualification, negotiation, disco. By the way, like disco is this new term, right? For a discovery call. <laughs> Felt like such an ass the first time I had to ask him like disco call, <laughs> like Googling it, what's a disco call? But now I can't stop saying it. It'll be uncool. It's probably uncool already, David. You should take that out because if I'm saying it, it's not cool. I'm way behind. Um, all right, here we go. Survey says from Gong, qualification. Interesting. That's call one, folks. Look at that. Close rates declined 71% when the seller didn't cover next steps on the first call. Deals closed fastest that talked more time about next steps on the first call. So that means, think about that buyer's triangle again, right? I'm just at the very beginning trying to decide if you're, if it's even worth doing business together, but I take time right then. It's like a good five minutes. Say, if we decide that we're going to keep dating, here's what it looks like. Okay. We're going to do this step and this step. And then this step, here's the process together. How does that work for you? What are the right steps? What's the right timeline? Okay. This isn't a cursory, Hey, here's what we do next. This is a walking them through the buying process. And I think the reason for this, and I um, am not affiliated with Gong, I do not speak on their behalf, <laughs> but be clear. I think the reason for this is that psychology that we talked about at the beginning. You're helping shift them into the buying process out of the problem recognition process. That's selling. You're shifting them into buying mode, not just, huh, maybe mode. Make sense? All right, next quiz question. How much more likely are we to close if we have a well-defined selling process that obviously includes closing? So I was telling you that the time where I <laughs> tried to date a customer, <laughs> the problem was that my sales process was whacked. I didn't know what I was closing for on the next step. I was really messed up, right? And we did wind up getting some of that business, but I didn't join any more calls. <laughs> I felt like such a jerk. All right, so this is the question. 50% from Lisa, 75% from David. Victor's at 80%. Melissa, 40%. 40% more likely to close more deals if our sales process is well defined. 62%. I love that. Kathy, did you know that 37.8% of all statistics are made up and that 96.4 people will believe you if you include a decimal? The answer, according to the task group, is 33%. So it is important that we define the steps. It's also important that we close for the next step each time, and that's closing for commitment. On qualification, we can close for the disco call. On the disco close, pardon me, the disco call, we can close for getting further needs or bringing more stakeholders to the demo in the next step. On the proposal, we can close for reviewing budgets, looking at past contracts, bringing questions to the negotiation call. At negotiation, we can close with a trial close. Hey, if we can meet all of these needs, are you gonna be ready to sign the contract? And at the close, we can agree. They're going to sign the ink by Friday in order to get the blank. I used an add-on close here. Does this make sense, you guys? Each step we're closing for what's next to us. If you're a sales leader attending this, the best thing you can do is make sure you have gates defined so that your sales process aligns with your pipeline process and people aren't allowed to progress to the next stage unless they can check those boxes. Now, I said 15 minutes ago that we're over-processed and that these aren't boxes to check. We have to have this. The training is what makes the difference so that we're not just asking a rote question to check a box, but teaching reps how to ask them for a deep understanding, how to build the connection while they ask them, how to be the trusted advisor, not just a sales rep. All right, there's another time it's really important to close and that can happen almost anywhere. And that's when you get a buying signal. It happens and the buying signal can be way back early on call one. What do you do? 
Abandon script. Okay. Forget about your process. Forget about your sales script. Shut up and go for a trial close or a tie down. Are you ready to buy today? Oh, whoa, hold the phones. Sounds like you know exactly what you want. Are you ready to buy today? Um, all right, cool. Well, I'll tell you what, let me just pause here. Assuming we can align on the price, how soon are you ready to do this? Well, if I can show you all four of those functions, is this something you want to buy this month? Okay, the first two are trial closes. The second two are tie downs. If you haven't heard of a tie down before, be careful Googling it at work. <laughs> but what a tie down is, is an if then statement. If I could blank, are you ready to blank? Okay, it's an if then, it's a type of trial close. Okay, we're not pressuring, we're aligning. There's nothing worse than when you're dying to buy something and the jerk won't be quiet. So you can just give them a credit card and get it bought. Like I said, I hate shopping, love buying, hate shopping. All right, that is why the UPS guy is like a personal family friend at my house on Amazon day. We are very close. Now, we talked about trial closing or tying down or abandoning the process when you get a buying signal. If not, stick with the process. Um, question on here, but close equals a commitment. David, you're gonna have to tell me more about that. Steven wants to see if we can have a copy of the sample process. You bet, you guys are gonna get all this stuff. Cool, let's talk about closing now that we're virtual and then we'll go to some questions. So if you were in field sales in the past, then closing was as simple as stopping by next Tuesday, right? Hey, I'll get you next time I'm here. what you think about? Even just being there is that pressure, the presence, right? Oh crap, I, I gotta get my answer for LB. Yeah, we've been thinking about it. Let me just see, right? Or hey, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be there next week. Are we were able to use our physical presence as a little bit of pressure, as a little bit of a push on the timeline, okay? So it, it, it's harder to connect when we're not face-to-face. -face. So my advice for my former field sellers is um, you've got to set up the calls ahead of time, okay? You can't be talking to them and then just let it go because in virtual, it's going to take 10 dials to get a hold of them again, right? You guys know this. Which is easier, to get somebody to show up to a scheduled meeting or to get somebody to pick up their damn phone during the workday? So field sellers, it's normal, okay? You're not a past, you're helping them set the appointment before you get off the call. That's called call bridging, okay? If it's a cold call, call bridging is giving yourself permission to call back. For the rest of us, it's setting a date and time to reconnect. Never get off the phone until you've set the next appointment. Do it better by sending a calendar invite. And at the end of that, you close for the commitment. Let me give you an example of that. Hey, I know you've got to run. Let's finish this next week. Is Tuesday afternoon open? Can I send an invite for 1 p.m. your time? Hey, will you please bring a few samples of what you sent last year? I'll make it a video link and you can show me. Tell you what, can I give you my cell phone in case you can't make it? Here it is. What's yours? Now nah, you've got some good information here. You've closed for a commitment. You've got a follow-up. You've got their cell phone. You've got an appointment. That's well closed. And it's what you have to do in virtual sales. Okay. If we don't, our sales cycles pull longer and longer and longer. Bridging and closing for a commitment shortens the timeline. We've covered seven things together today. Um, and I love all the interaction. I really appreciate it. Right? Shocking closing stats, why we don't close, the mindset, a few new techniques to try, when to close, how to close every call with a commitment, and closing now you're virtual. If you picked up one or two things that you liked um, that you want to learn more about, I'm thrilled. You can learn more about it in a master class and go deeper, right? This was fun. We call it edutainment, but it wasn't training. We're not going to see anybody change their skills and habits consistently after this, so we're offering the training. It's a four-week master class. I've got four classes in here, you guys. Proposing with value, overcoming objections, closing for commitment, and closing confidently as well. We'll also do two live sessions. We call them happy hours where you can get individual feedback and coaching. Uh, we listed at $9.99. I've got a big price break. Part of the reason for the price break is that I'm very, very sorry I canceled this in December. I was sick as a dog. Um, the first live happy hour is February 3rd. 
You've got to sign up by the 27th if you want to do it. You can go to factorate.com forward slash closing to learn more. Um, and you can also email if you want to sign up your team. Um, I think that is a single person price and we'll work with you if you've got a team to put in. Um, if you're done and you need to run, I hope you'll connect with me if we're not already so that we can stay friends. That is my personal email address there as well if you want any follow-up questions. All right, so I'm gonna go over to my chat and to my questions for anybody who wants to stay on and chat a little bit. For everybody else, happy new year and have a wonderful afternoon. My gift to you is seven minutes. You can actually pee before your next Zoom call. How's that? Thanks for joining everybody. Oh, you're welcome. I love the thanks. Thanks. We have a copy of the commitment. David, if you're still on, tell me what your question is. There was a, a one of your last comments in there. All right. I don't see anything in chat. I'm pulling up questions and it looks like that was chat too. So I'll just hang here for another minute or two in case anybody has a question. I like that, Kurt. Pitch the solution, not the product. Thanks for coming. You're welcome. Thanks, Shane. This is my awkward silence to give somebody time to chat in a question. Can you show the slide again about the discovery call? Michelle, thanks Mike. Um, can you show the slide about the discovery call again? I'm gonna go backwards. I think this is what we were closing. So give me more information, Michelle, while I go back. Stop, <laughs> I love it. Forward, I'm waiting for you to tell me. Forward is a yes, I think. Oh, you want the example on call bridging, don't you? There, all right. Call bridging is giving yourself permission to call back. The example is here. I think this is where you wanna be, Michelle. Chat me if it's not it. That's my cell phone, by the way, if anybody wants to text me. Back one. <laughs> You're very welcome. All right, I'm gonna close up the CBS mailbag. It was a pleasure spending a few hours with you guys. Pardon me, a few minutes with you guys. Um, Ariel, yeah, the recording's going to be available, but I'm telling you, if you like it, come to the classes. They're better. Hey, we go deep into all of these, right? If you think you've got to get better at closing, come invest in yourself and get better at closing. It's it's not a price point kind of situation, I don't think, right? It, and it shouldn't hopefully take too much time. Trying to get your team's budget on board. Yay, good. Let me know if I can help. You're such a different these things are fun and I love doing them, but there's such a difference between this and actually training and practicing. It's all about confidence and closing and building muscle memory. And we've got to train and practice and train and practice. So if you have a team, get them this training and work with them all the time on it. Oh, you're managing a budget for the first time. That's exciting. Scary, isn't it? Yeah. I remember the first time I got to submit a budget, it was like, I don't even know what to ask for. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Let's make sure we connect, Ariel. I think we'll be friends. All right. I'm going to head out. So I have three minutes before my next meeting. I hope everybody has a good afternoon. Bye, everybody. Thanks again.